church, a force for good and for God and his glory, sent and commissioned, committed in submission to go to a world that needs to know the good news of a God that breaks down the divide and welcomes the prodigal to call him his own. Through trials and storms, the faithful are steadfast, trusting God's grace and his plan and his ways. A picture of obedience, a willingness to go. Unwavering is the commitment to keep pressing on. For the sake of the gospel and the world that he loves, it cannot quit growing and will not give in. For the promise is with us and our God, he will win. Good morning. Hey, there it is. You got to turn the power on. That's how it works. Hey, good morning. Uh, I, my name's Chad. Um, Drew's going to be on vacation for the next couple of weeks, and so I have the opportunity to bring God's word to us today. And my uh, heart, my desire is always as we get into God's word that we would be more than just hearers of stories, that we'd be listeners and doers of the word. They would deeply transform the people that we are, how we see the world around us, and how we live in it. So today, that's our goal. And I just want to start us with this question, is what do we do when we run into dead ends in life? Those moments in our life where no matter how hard we try, that we just can't move forward in them. That we thought we knew the direction that we were going we, we had a path in front of us that we knew we were supposed to head on, and then there's a dead end, there's a roadblock that just sends us going back to God and going, God, I don't know what to do now. And here's the truth of the situation. For many of you in the room, you're a follower of Jesus. Some of us aren't yet, but for many of you that are, we're not exempt from that. In fact, we even find dead ends in our own ministry. Because we thought we were being faithful, we thought we were doing the things that God called us to do, and then when we're up against it, we find out, man, that we're up against it. And we don't know how to move forward from that. And so that's what today's message is going to be about as we jump back into the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts, primarily in Acts chapter 23, um, and we're going to read a story of Paul. It's a story of Paul where it seems like he came up against a dead end. But in fact, what seemed like a dead end to Paul and what seems like a dead end to us in Paul's story is in fact God's plan all along. And so we're going to start off in Acts chapter 22, verse 30. And the story today uh, picks up exactly where we left off last week. If you remember last week, Paul was at the temple. He was teaching. Um, there was a mob that formed. They, uh, there was a riot that drug him out of the temple. They took him in front of the city gates that they were almost ready to beat him to death whenever the city guard, the commander of the Roman army, he shows up and he stops it right there. He finds out that Paul's a Roman citizen and Roman citizens have rights. And so now he's between a rock and a hard place because his job is to keep peace in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, largely so that they will keep sending money, taxes, back to Rome. Because when you disturb the peace, well, the money has a tendency to stop going back to Rome. So that's his main job. But also, also, citizens have rights. And part of those rights is that he's innocent until proven guilty. So the scene is now the Roman guard is trying to find out is Paul innocent or is he guilty? And that's where we pick up verse 22, or chapter 22 of Acts, um, verse 30. But on the next day, the day after the riot had happened, the day after he was in front of those city gates almost to be beat to death, on the next day, desiring to know the real reason while he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priest and all the council to meet, uh, to meet and he brought Paul down and set him before them. Let's pause right there just for a moment. The council that's being spoke of is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the gathering of 70 Jewish elders that kind of made up the supreme court of Jewish law and ritual. And so they were standing there to act as counsel to the Roman rulers to say, what's going on? We'll pick back up in uh, chapter 23, verse 1. And looking intently at the council... 
Paul said before, said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood around him to strike him in the mouth. And then Paul said, God is going to strike you down, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I didn't know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part, one part of the room that he's in, one part is Sadducees and the others are Pharisees, he cried out to the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, son of Pharisees. And it is with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Pharisees said that there is no resurrection, nor angels, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge all of them. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisee party stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him away from among them by force and to bring him into the barracks. This sets the scene of Paul's circumstance. See, at first it seems like Paul has come to a dead end, and no matter how hard he tries, that he just can't get out of this position that he finds himself in. But we're going to find out as we continue to look at the scriptures that what seems like a dead end to Paul is actually part of God's plan just waiting to be revealed See, Paul's standing in front of the Sanhedrin, ready to defend himself. He looks into the room with boldness. He's a bold person. He has confidence, and he begins to plead his innocent. Not guilty. Not before God. Not before man. I haven't done anything wrong. I think the thing that happens next probably shocked everybody in the room, including Paul. He's slapped in the, in the face. What an act of disrespect for a man to be slapped in the face by another man while he was simply trying to defend himself. And Paul, Paul's a fiery guy. He, he's not afraid of a fight, so he fires right back. How dare you strike me, you whitewashed wall, which is to say that you are white, you're clean on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. You're a hypocrite. You hypocrite. How dare you put your hands on me while God is going to strike you down. What happens next is those around him go, how dare you talk to the high priest in, in such a way? And Paul's reply is, brothers, I didn't know. I didn't realize that he was the high priest or I wouldn't have spoken to him that way because God's word says, do not speak evil about your, the ruler of your people. At first, when we read this, this might seem uh, hard to believe that Paul wouldn't have known who the high priest was. But um, Paul had been traveling for the last 20 years as an evangelist, primarily in Gentile regions. And so he hadn't spent a lot of time in Jerusalem as where the high priest would have, would have lived. And Ananias had only been the high priest for less than 10 years. Mixed with that, that there's no TV, there's no newspapers, there's no pictures of him anywhere. So he would have known him by reputation, which wasn't a good one. And he would have known him by name, but he wouldn't have known him by face. And since they're in a, a Roman council, they're not in their normal uh, place that they would gather for judgment, he's not sat at a seat of honor, which would distinguish him generally from the other elders, the other 70 that are in the room. And mixed with that, in Galatians, we find out that Paul was likely very poor, had very poor eyesight. Because in Galatians, as he writes the letter, he says, look how big I write to you. And he says that if uh, I know that if you were able to give me your eyes so that I could be uh, greater in ministry, that you would do so. And so understanding that Paul had probably never seen Ananias, or if he did, not very often. Understanding that um, he wasn't sat in a seat of honor. And, and finally, that Paul had poor eyesight. There's every reason to believe when he said, I didn't know. And that he changes his tone, that he was being honest. The thing that happens next is that Paul begins to change 
how he is um, defending himself. He changes his tactics. His tactics was once personal self-defense about his integrity and as well as his theological uh, commitment. But now it says that he looks around the room and he recognizes that there's Sadducees and there's Pharisees that are there. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were the two prominent sects in the Jewish time. Think two political parties with very different ideologies, very different beliefs, very different understandings of how the world should be and is. The Sadducees, on one hand, they didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in the spiritual realm. They believed in God, but they didn't believe of anything else beyond that. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they believed in all those things. They believed in the spiritual realm that existed around them, that there was, there was angels, there was demons, there was good, there was bad. They believed that the, God would send a Messiah and that he would bring God's kingdom here to this world. They had very similar beliefs as we did and that Paul did. They also believed in the everlasting, that one day everyone would be raised from the dead, either for eternity with God or eternity in judgment. As Paul perceives this, he looks around the room and says, the reason that I'm on trial is not because of my own character. The reason I'm on trial is the resurrection of the dead. See, the resurrection was then and still is the central event that took place in the life of Jesus. On this, every other fact of his ministry hinges on that. If, he, if it wasn't for the resurrection, well, he would have just been another dead preacher. And so he looks around and he says, it's the resurrection that I'm on trial for today. And at that, the room explodes. The Pharisees on one side are going, that sounds pretty good to us. Like maybe he heard an angel. Maybe there was somebody that raised from the dead. The Sadducees are at the opposite side crying, heresy, heresy. There's no such thing as the resurrection. And the room becomes so explosive that it gets physically violent to the point that the tribune is concerned that Paul's going to be torn to pieces. So he sends the garden, they forcibly remove him, and they take him to the barracks. And that is where he sits and he waits. That night, I could imagine Paul just is discouraged because it's in the night that our minds start to wander, isn't it? It's in the darkness of the night that our soul feels the heaviest and that we begin to go, God, is this really your plan? Are you sure you didn't have something else in store? We can understand that same feeling as we jump back in in verse 11. It says, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. The Lord would have come and stood near to Paul and say, take courage, unless Paul was discouraged. So he comes to encourage him in his time of need and suffering. Take courage, as you testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify about me in Rome. The work that you've been doing, it's not finished yet, Paul. That's his encouragement. What's happened here, you're going to do there. I have a plan. You might not see it, but it is coming. It's an encouragement of God's providence in, in Paul's life. God's providence is an important um, thing for us to understand. Providence is the understanding that God is working all things behind the scenes for his glory and for the good of those who love him and whom he loves. It's the understanding that he sees all things, that nothing is unseen by him. He is in control of all things, and he provides in all things areas. In order for us really to have a full understanding of God's providence, because a lot of times we understand it as God's provision, that he cares and that he gives, which is a a big part of it, but there's something bigger going on. And for us to understand it, the the most important uh, way for us to understand providence is to go to the very first uh, time it's spoken of in the scriptures, which brings us all the way back to Genesis chapter 22, the very first book in the Bible. And that story is probably familiar to a lot of us. It's Abraham and Isaac. God says that I'm going to test Abraham's faithfulness. And so he tells them, Abraham, you know that son I gave you, that one and only son, that son of promise. You're going to take him up to the mountain and you're going to sacrifice him. 
Now, we know the ending of the story is that Abraham doesn't have to sacrifice Isaac, that God provides, that God shows up, and that he has a different story in place. And that ultimately, this becomes a foretelling of God sending his one and only son, that he's the sacrificial lamb that dies on our behalf, that he doesn't hold back his very own son for us. But up to this point, in Abraham and Isaac, as they walk up the mountain, they don't know that yet. All they know is faithful obedience in a time that feels like a dead end. And so in chapter 7, as they walk up the mountain, Isaac's a young man, he's not a child, and he looks at his father and he goes, Father, where is the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? In verse 8, Abraham answers and he says, God will provide for himself the lamb. Whenever he says provides, it's the Hebrew word that doesn't mean provision in the way that we would understand it. It actually means the directest translation is sees. That God sees what's going on. That he has understanding of the circumstance. That there is nothing outside of, what he, of his understanding, even though it's outside of my understanding, son. God sees and that God will provide. That he sees all things. There's nothing unnoticed. There is nothing unexpected. Not only does he see, but he will also provide. That's the faith that Abraham had, and that's the faith that Paul had. Eventually, Abraham gets up to the top of the hill with his son. As he gets ready to do the sacrificial ceremony, God provides a ram to them in place of his son. And Abraham sacrifices the ram there. And then he names the place, as it's translated in the King James Version, Jehovah Jireh, which means God is the provider, that God sees all, that he has providential sovereignty over all, that he is the provider, and there he worships God. That's the same story for us today, that God sees God sees you right where you are. He knows of your every circumstance. There is nothing that's going on in your life now and then in the, or in the past or coming in the future that God does not see and does not have a plan for. Augustine, when he talks about God's providence, he says that God's providence is like that of a masterful weaver, that he's skillfully working all threads together for our lives to create a beautiful tapestry according to his divine design. Nothing is wasted. Nothing's left on the cutting room floor. Nothing is purposeless. That he is able to bring good even out of the most difficult and challenging circumstance. And that's the message for us. What a beautiful message, isn't it? That God has a plan even for things that we don't understand. That nothing will be wasted. That your stories have a purpose. That they're There's nothing that's outside of his sovereign rule and outside of the purpose for his plans. When we recognize this, we recognize that God's uh, perspective is infinitely greater than our own. And we recognize this, it allows us to be patient in adversity. When those challenging times come that we might not know, we might not understand, but we know the one that does. It allows us to be thankful in our prosperity, attributing all the goodness that we have to God. And it allows us to be confident in every situation in our life. When I was a kid, we used to camp all the time. That was our family vacation. We camped. We lived in Arizona, uh, southern Arizona, and we'd often travel to northern Arizona. And I remember it was Easter, and it doesn't snow in Easter in Texas because It doesn't snow in Texas, but it does snow in northern Arizona, even on Easter. And so we were camping, and we were driving home, and um, it had had started snowing. We actually left camp early. My dad's like, we got to get over the pass before the snowstorm comes. And so as we're driving up the hill, we see a boat sliding back down towards us. There's no trailer. There's just a boat down the highway coming at us. My dad looks over, he's like, that's different. And there's some dude, like, in shorts, running after the boat, trying to chase it down. He's like, do you need help? The guy's like, no, and he just keeps running. I don't, he, I guess he caught his boat, I don't know. But we, as we got, we came up closer to the hill, like, the snow, it moved from that kind of light, fluffy snow 
to this thick, wet snow that was just freezing the road. And my dad's driving this 1977 um, uh, uh, Jeep, and, and it wasn't even made for the highway in the best of conditions, and now we're in the worst of condi- conditions. And I remember sitting in the back seat with my little sister in complete peace, just thinking like, yeah, that was pretty crazy. That guy was running down the road after the boat. Like, I wasn't worried about the storm at all. And the reason why is it wasn't because I was not concerned about the storm. It was because I trusted the one that was behind the will. I knew that my dad had a plan and he knew where we were going, even if I couldn't see. And I think sometimes, like we all know the, the experience of our kids going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? I think sometimes it's not, we're not going, God, are we there yet? We're going, God, are you sure we're on the right road? God, is this the right direction? God, is this the right plan? Because it don't feel like it. It feels like a dead end. It feels like a snowstorm. God has a plan. He sees it. He, he provides a way even when we can't see the way. And that's kind of what starts happening here. So first, Paul ends up in his circumstance that feels like a dead end. God get, uh, Paul gets a promise for God, from God that this isn't a dead end. And then as we jump back into verse 12, we start finding out um, God's taking steps ultimately to, uh, to take Paul into Rome. So let's pick up there. Verse 12 of 23, it says, It was day, uh, oh, excuse me, it, when it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by oath neither to eat nor drink until they killed Paul. They were more, there were more than 40 of them who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priest and the elders and they said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case more exactly, and we are, but we will be ready to kill him before he comes near. Now, the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and he brought him to the tribune and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you want to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire some more, some more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink until they have killed him. And now they're ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him not to tell, tell that he had informed me of any of this. Then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go for Caesarea on the third hour of the night. Also provide a mount for Paul to ride on and to bring him safely to Felix, the governor. God often uses unlikely sources for his purposes. Paul had found himself with a unlikely ally. It was his captors that God would use as part of his plan. See, after Paul had been removed from the trial at the Sanhedrin, they took him to the barracks, and they began to uh, plot an assassination attempt. Forty men filled with enough hate and anger that they were willing to forego food and water until they had murdered him without a trial. Paul's nephew finds out about this plot, a young kid, that he goes to Paul, and Paul goes, you better go tell Claudius. And he goes and he tells Claudius, and Claudius' response is, don't tell anyone. And he immediately starts assembling a team. He calls together two centurions, two leaders. He says, make sure that you grab 200 soldiers to go with you. And as if that's not enough, also grab yourself 70 uh, uh, horsemen with swords and with honor, uh, armor and power. And if that wasn't enough, also grab 200 spearmen to go with you. 
And so Paul now has this small army as an escort taking him where God had intended for him to go. I don't want us to miss the significance of this moment. That which was once Paul's roadblock becomes the thing that God uses for his plan. Paul's once captors become his protectors. Those who seem like they were preventing him now are the ones that are taking him. I don't think that Claudius woke up the, that day and said, how can I be used by God today? Because Claudius was a Roman. He believed in the pantheon of gods, not the one and the true and the only living God. But Paul did. Paul woke up that day and he received an encouragement from God that says, I'm not done with you yet. And Paul believed and Paul trusted and God came through by using an unlikely source. God could use anything for his purposes in our lives. God could use anything for his purposes, for his glory and for the work that he's doing in this world. There's gonna be days in our life where we feel discouraged, that we feel like we've hit this dead end, that we're up against it, that we're gonna ask God, didn't you have a plan? God, don't you remember me? But if we remember that God is in control, that he is still sovereign, that he has a plan, that he sees all things, that nothing is a surprise to him, that he can take even this and that he can make something good out of it, it gives us a great deal of peace and hope and courage for our life, that he still does have a plan. Last year, over the summer, there was one of the young ladies at the church um, she was a high school senior. She was going to uh, Mission Arlington with, with our, our youth group. Every year in the summer, they go to Arlington and, and they serve children in that community. And her plan was to join that. But right at the last minute, she came down with mono and she got very sick, wasn't able to go. Calls the church the day before they're leaving. Hey, JP, I can't go. And so JP reaches out to me and he goes, hey, man, I know you were thinking about Wyatt going, but now it's, it seemed like it was too late. Well, there's a spot open. So my son ends up going on the trip unexpectedly. And as he's there, him and one of his other friends, that they start telling this kid, this kid's name's Anthony, they start telling him about Jesus. And day after day, they showed up to take him to VBS. And day after day, they told him about his, their story. And they told him about, about their own testimony. And they told him about what Jesus had done for them in their life. And day after day, they showed up. And when you're 10, there's something cool about a 12 or 13-year-old. It's the only time. No other time is something cool about a 12 or 13-year-old. But when you're 10, there is. And so there was one day, it was kind of towards the end, the day before the last day, they asked Anthony, Anthony, would you like to follow Jesus the way that we follow Jesus? And right then and there, he made a decision to follow Jesus, to make him his Lord and his Savior. He didn't come from a Christian household. He might not have known Jesus any other way. Romans says, how will they believe unless somebody is sent? Somebody was sent. See, it seemed like a closed door. It seemed like a, a dead end. It seemed like a red light for the young lady who got mono. But what seemed like a closed door and a red light was actually an open opportunity, not for Wyatt, but for Anthony. Because that's who the plan was for. I think so often in our life, we think that our circumstances are always all about us. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes we're not the hero of the story. Sometimes the universe doesn't revolve around us and what's going on in our world. That God can use your story. That God could use your circumstances for his plan. And maybe that plan's for somebody else. Maybe your story is meant to be an encouragement and point somebody else to Jesus. When we recognize that God's perspective is so much greater than ours, we have this sense of optimism. It's not this naive kind of sense of op optimism where we go, well, this is really tough. God must have a big blessing for me. No, it, it's more real than that. It's a sense of of confidence in who's behind the will. It's a confidence in the Lord that he can take seemingly dead things and that he can make something from them. He could take a dead end and has a purpose for it. That he can take Paul's captors 
and use them for his purpose. That he can take a case of mono and that he could bring a kid to a lasting hope. That he could take something that was made for death like the cross and that he could bring everlasting life from it. God sees you too. God sees your situation. He sees your circumstances. There's nothing that's missed by him and that he's weaving something together even out of the most challenging, difficult parts of our story. Normally, we close with a, um, a point of application. Now go do this. Today, I want to close a little different. I want us to close and just sit in silence. Silence because we, come from a, we came in here from a, a noisy world. We came in here with the radio on. We walked into the foyer and we met friends. We came in here and we worshiped. We, then we listened to somebody speak. And it was just noise after noise after noise. Not bad. Good noise. I hope, I hope this message was a good noise. But I want us just to ha- sit for a moment and reflect on the providence of God in our world and in our life. And just hear from him for a moment. As you do so, my hope is that we have faith that God knows, that God cares, that God can, and that God will. So let's sit in silence as you speak with the Lord and the Lord speaks to you, and then I'll end us in prayer and then we'll worship together. God, you see all. There is nothing that is missed by you. That you know what was, you know what is now, and you know what is to come. You are sovereign over every situation. We believe and we trust that you love us, God. That you have a plan for our life. That you have a plan for all this world to redeem and to restore it. God, we trust in your your providential rule, your sovereignty over this world, that you tell the rain where to fall, the lightning where to strike, the wind where to blow, that you control all of creation, that you uphold the universe with your hands, that there is not an atom in our system that is not under your sovereign rule. God, we hold all that up to you. We hold it up to you and we trust you, that we know the one that's behind the will We don't always understand our circumstances. We don't have to, God, that we can look to you and we can trust you. God, we pray for a sense of peace and hope. We pray that you stir us up, God. We pray that you use our stories and our circumstances as a blessing in the life of others. We love you, God. We pray all this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, let's stand up as we worship.